Hello and welcome to the fourth video in our series Introducing Systemic Pathology. Now this video is going to be covering aspects of gynecological pathology and as we've said in previous videos this isn't going to be comprehensive but it is going to be hopefully a signpost uh, to guide you towards the knowledge that you'll need in this topic area. So what are we going to cover today? Well first of all we're going to be describing some of the pathology that takes place in the cervix and this will lead us on to talking about cervical cancer and the main risk factors for cervical cancer. We're then going to identify some of the main features of cervical cancer screening and the steps towards preventing cervical cancer. We'll talk about endometrial pathology and in particular we'll talk about endometrial cancer and the risk factors that lead to endometrial cancer. And then finally we'll be talking very broadly about ovarian tumours and in particular ovarian cancer and its risk factors. So to understand the pathology of the cervix to begin with you have to go back to your basic anatomy and histology. So the cervix is at the inferior aspects of the uterus. It essentially is this bridging portion between the uterus and the vagina. Now we know that part of the cervix faces the vagina, and we call that the ectocervix. And we have a cervical opening that is the external orifice that faces the, uh, the vaginal cavity. The inner aspect of the cervix leading up to the uterus we refer to as the endocervix. Now the ectocervix is lined by stratified squamous epithelium and that's an adaptation to cope with the acidic uh, environment of the vagina. And the inner lining, the endocervix, is actually lined by columnar epithelial cells with uh, goblet cells. And what we know is that that's responsible for producing the spical mucus that forms the mucus plug in the cervix. Now what we do know is that there is a sharp transition where you change from the stratified squamous epithelium to columnar epithelium and we call this the transition zone or transformation zone. Posh terms squamo-columnar junction. Now you can see on the far left side there of that image that's just cropped up that we have stratified squamous epithelium. So that's flat egg-shaped cells that are um, packed on top of one another and that's an adaptation to the acidic conditions within the vagina. Then in the middle you can see quite sharp change and on the right hand side of the image we then have columnar epithelium with um, goblet cells interspersed in between and that is where the endocervix begins. And if we think about this anatomically it would roughly be in that region there where you would find the, what we call the transformation zone. Now because this is an area of cellular change and because this is an area of cell turnover, because this is dynamic, it's not just an area that remains static, we know that this is the site where pathology will occur because this is where we're getting cellular changes taking place. And wherever you have cellular change taking place, you have the potential to form mutations and those mutations can then result in forming dysplastic cells, abnormal cells, and that leads to cancer. So what causes cervical cancers? Well, the vast majority of cervical cancers are caused by this, what we call HPV virus. Now, this is a DNA virus that's transmitted through sexual contact. Now, once this virus infects cells, it acts to suppress something called a, uh, or deactivate, sorry, something called a tumor suppressor gene, called P53. Once it infects the cells, it deactivates the tumor suppressor gene, so cellular turnover can effectively go by unchecked, and we get rapid turnover of cells that then leads to abnormal mutated cells, and that's where we get our cervical cancer. Now, HPV um, has over 100 different strains, but what we're interested in are particular strains that can cause cervical cancers. And the most oncogenic, meaning that will cause a cancer, are 16 and 18, and they account for about 75% of cervical cancers. But then also HPV 31 and 45 are responsible for about 10 to 15%, so the, the remaining cervical cancers. And we know that the HPV virus transmitted through sexual contact is the main culprit in developing cervical cancers. So when we think about risk factors for cervical cancer, it all relates to sexual intercourse and a few other factors. So first of all, unprotected intercourse is a risk factor. Having multiple sexual partners is a risk factor, or a partner that has multiple partners. Also having an early age of first intercourse. But then we have other risk factors such as smoking, 
using the oral contraceptive pill does increase your risk of cervical cancer, but evidence shows that when you stop taking the pill, then it reduces your risk straight away. Or the risk, uh, that's probably incorrect to say, but actually that um, when you stop taking the pill, that increased risk goes away. Um, and multiple pregnancies as well is a risk factor. Now, how we're trying to prevent cervical cancer is by introducing this, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. So this is a vaccination against the human papillomavirus. And you can see that it targets some of the main oncogenic types, so 16 and 18 is in there, and also 6 and 11. Now, they cause genital warts. And this has been introduced uh, into the UK immunization program, and it's given to girls um, during high school years. And it's hoped that this will help to reduce incidences of cervical cancer. Now, what do we do to try and detect cervical cancer before it's actually developed? Well, we have the National Cervical Cancer Screening Programme in the UK. Now, what this aims to do is not necessarily detect cervical cancers, which it, 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 it will do and can do, but it's really to detect abnormal cells that can be indicative of changes that are precancerous and leading up to what we call cervical cancer. Now really we're looking at what's called carcinoma in situ or um, as it's known in the cervix cervical intraepithelial neoplasia so developing new cells new abnormal cells within the cervix and last year we also introduced uh, routine HPV testing during this stage as well. So what happens is from the age of about 25 women are invited for a cervical smear or pap smear um, this essentially takes a surface scraping of the cervix and takes away some of the cells which are then sent to a cytology laboratory. And in cytology they look at the morphology of the cells and try and detect whether there are any abnormal cells or what we call dyskaryotic cells. It will also at that point test for HPV. And if we find abnormal cells or the cells are HPV positive, then the woman will be invited for a colposcopy appointment. Now this is where... Um, Usually a, a gynecologist will visualise the cervix um, and will look for any abnormal changes, particularly around that transformation zone end, and will also take any biopsies at that point if there are any suspicious areas. They can be then sent off to the pathologist. We take what's called a comb biopsy. They're sent off to the pathologist and they look down the microscope and they're looking for any of these new epithelial changes. If they're found, and we can see a precancerous lesion, then they'll be invited for um, treatment. And we can use laser therapy, cryotherapy, or in some cases, resection of that area to treat it. So what do we mean in terms of these precancerous changes? Well, essentially, these are the sort of uh, hallmark signs that there are changes occurring within the cells that could potentially lead to cancer. And we call it in the cervix cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. So this is new cells, new abnormal cells developing within the cervical epithelium. But you'll remember from, from basic pathology that cancer is invasive. So these are neoplasia that's invasive, breaching the basement membrane and spreading down into other tissues. So what we're doing here is just looking at those changes that are occurring within the epithelium before they've broken that line of the basement membrane. And we grade this. And we have CIN1, CIN2 and CIN3. So CIN stands for that cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. And in grade 1, only a third of the epithelium is affected. So you can see at the bottom of the epithelium there, in the lower third of the epithelium, there's an increased cell population. In the second image, it's about two-thirds of the epithelium. And we're starting to see some nuclear irregularity there, some active cells down there. And also you can see it's starting to extend down a little bit. When you get to grade 3 on the far side, practically the whole of the epithelium is affected, and you can see it's starting, it's not breached the basement membrane, but it's starting to extend down. That is the highest grade of uh, intraepithelial neoplasia, and we would want to treat that straight away. Now, how does cervical cancer present? Well, hopefully we detect it in the screening program, or we did detect the precancerous stages in the screening program, sorry. Um, but the main symptoms are intermenstrual bleeding and particularly postcoital bleeding. So they're the main things that we're interested in. So let's talk about endometrial cancer. 
So endometrial cancer is not uncommon. But you can see that it has, at the moment, pretty good survival rates. So 78% of patients um, survive for more for 10 years or more. But there's a significant number of cases that are preventable in terms of uh, endometrial cancer. So what's the pathology of endometrial carcinoma? Well, there's different types of endometrial cancer, but the most common type is type 1, which is known as the endometrioid form. There's also then type 2, which is serous or clear cell, and this is less common. There are some key mutations that occur in endometrial cancers, and in particular these relate to the P10 and P53 tumor suppressors, among others, so there's a variety of different mutations that can occur. But the main symptom for endometrial cancer is postmenopausal bleeding. Now the risk factors for endometrial carcinoma all relate to estrogen exposure, because we think of uh, estrogen as a growth factor. Effectively, estrogen is stimulating cell growth. Now, the main things that therefore contribute are obesity, um, and obesity um, because fat is a source of estrogen, uh, using long-term hormone replacement therapy, and also having used tamoxifen, which is sort of a, um, a drug that's used to treat breast cancer, and also polycystic ovarian syndrome, and also genetic factors such as Lynch syndrome. So Lynch syndrome um, is um, previously known as hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, or HNPCC, um, is where you get uh, defects in microsatellite instability, effectively, and you get mutations that can occur as a result of that. And also diabetes is a risk factor. So endometrial cancer, we stage using the FIGO staging system, and I would recommend that you, you have a look at that if you're revising this as a topic area. Um, but there's a number of things that we can do for uh, endometrial cancers. Of course, you can use chemotherapy, radiotherapy, but you can also, um, you can also perform a hysterectomy um, if necessary as well. So ovarian cancer. Now, Ovarian cancer doesn't have a, a fantastic prognosis. You can see here um, that survival is only about 35% at 10 years or more. And we know that a significant proportion, about 21%, are, are, are from preventable causes. Now, ovarian cancer has, tends to have quite a vague presentation. So you will often see in uh, an exam type question, but also you, you will see it in real life, that people present with very non-specific symptoms of abdominal bloating, abdominal pain, um, sort of, and, and are often uh, misdiagnosed initially as having uh, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. So they often have quite vague abdominal type symptoms. And that's because of the fact that this ovarian mass is starting to compress on surrounding tissues within there. And they often get a bloated feeling. They often feel full sooner as well. So what are the different types of ovarian tumour? Now, ovarian tumours are complex, but you can essentially split them in terms of the anatomy of the ovary. So if you think of this in terms of surface epithelial tumours, so these are tumours arriving from the surface epithelium around the ovary, these are by far the most common. Now there's several different types of surface epithelium tumours. The most common one of the surface epithelial tumours is the serous type, we then have mucinous, endometrioid, and then transition cell. So that's uh, cells similar to what you see in the bladder and lining the ureters. And that's also known as a Brenner tumour in terms of its eponymous name. If you then think of the germ cells that are found within the ovary, then we know that a number of tumours arise from those, and those are things like teratomas, dysgerminomas, and yolk sac tumours. Now, many of these tumours can be benign, but you can also get uh, malignant germ cell tumours as well. But we're not going to focus on the various different types of these. If you also then think of the tumours in terms of the sex cord stromal tumours. So these are tumours that are arising from the connective tissues that surround uh, the germ cells within the ovary. We have things called granulosa cell tumours and Leydig cell tumours. And these are um, hormonally active tumours. So you will get uh, hormonal changes as a result of this as well. 
We can also then, of course, have metastatic tumours. And one of the most common ones is called a Krukenberg's tumour, and that usually is from of gastric origin, usually upper GI origin, um, and has quite a, sig a, a significant characteristic sign on microscopy, which is that you get signet cells, signet ring cells um, on microscopy. So what are the risk factors for ovarian cancer? Well, we know that it relates to estrogen exposure. So obesity, hormone replacement therapy again. We also know that there's genetic factors in the sense of you, there's often a family history of it and we have the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations. Also this one called Lynch syndrome, which we've already um, discussed, but the reproductive history is important in ovarian cancer as well. In particular, um, people that haven't had what we call it an estrogen holiday. So patients that have never had children, they've uh, had a long estrogen exposure with an early onset of, of menstrual period, so early menarche and late menopause, or have never used um, a combined oral contraceptive pill. They're the main um, risk factors in terms of the reproductive history. Now, as we've said, in terms of the presentation, ovarian cancer presents very vaguely, so you tend to get bloating, sort of an IBS-type presentation with abdominal pain and discomfort. You can get postmenopausal and post postcoital bleeding, and also other GI symptoms like early fullness, what we call early satiety. So what have we covered in this tutorial? Well, we've described and explained the pathological changes that occur in the cervix. We've talked about risk factors for cervical cancer, and we've also identified the main features of the cervical screening program and what's involved. We've also uh, briefly touched on pathological changes that occur in the cervix and talked about endometrial cancer. And finally, we've, we've um, talked about risk factors for that, and we've talked about the various different types of ovarian tumour and how you might classify those in terms of simplifying it for your learning as well. So thank you very much for watching this video. Um, don't forget to subscribe to us and also to follow us on at Bite Size Path on Twitter. Uh, and you can like us on Facebook as well. Um, if you wish. Um, please be sure to keep tuned in because we've got another uh, video on breast pathology coming up soon and I hope you're finding them useful. Please leave any uh, comments, suggestions or questions in the comments boxes below. Thanks very much.